All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe for some of you, good morning uh, or even good evening. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, it's all about rethinking the talent shortage in 2023. Uh, Marcia, super glad to have you uh, again today. I, uh, I actually put neuroscientist because I needed to give you a title for this webinar. There could be so many titles that I could actually give you for, <laughs> for your introduction. Um, a practical note before um, uh, I will let you introduce yourself, Marcia. We are going to try to keep it within 30 minutes. So it's going to be a short one today. If you do have any questions, there is a question step or a chat functionality. Yeah, the question step, by the way, that's better. Then we can keep track of it. Uh, in the lower right corner of your screen. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them there and we will try to answer them either during the webinar or uh, during the last five minutes. Uh, and great to have you all here. Uh, having that said, uh, Marcia, could you briefly introduce yourself? For uh, Well, you're, you're almost an equal to team member yeah. by now. <laughs> don't know you yet. I feel like I'm part of your extended family by now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is Marcia. I'm a neuroscientist and I specialize in brain behavior relationships on the work floor. So I deal a lot with um, team dynamics, diversity and inclusion, mental health, but I also have a background in um, developing assessments to make sure that you bring in the right people into the organization, keeping in mind all of those topics. So keeping in mind, creating an inclusive and diverse culture, things like that. So uh, assessments and gamification. So I can understand why you just put neuroscientists because my career has been all over the place, but assessments, gamification, creating inclusive cultures in which everybody thrives, I guess that will be the goal. Cool. Yeah. And you actually uh, contributed to our own assessments as well. Uh, to give a brief intro, but I'm going to keep it very brief because we have a lot to tackle in 30 minutes. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm one of the founders of Equalture. We are an HR tech company based in the Netherlands. And what we basically do in a nutshell is we develop game-based assessments, also with the help of Marcia, that are being introduced at the very start of the hiring funnel to basically make sure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to showcase their talents, potential, etc. Um, but enough about equals here, because that, that's not what we are going to talk about today. We are going to talk about the shortage on the labor market. And I prepped a couple of slides as an introduction to the topic. Um, I found a very interesting research from uh, that the UN published recently, uh, in which they make a prediction of what the labor market looks like by 2050. And as you can see on the screen, we have almost 100 mil million fewer people in the labor market by 2050. Now, I can imagine that uh, I think we are already in an economic recession, maybe, or heading towards. So can imagine that a lot of people think, hey, maybe if recession hits, this is going to resolve itself. That is also a prediction that the UN made. Even in times of recession by 2050, we will still have millions of people short. Um, so it is a big wake up call to be aware of the fact that there will be more jobs than candidates. And that's also there to stay. How come that we that the, the shortage is getting so big? I think most of the people are aware of this, of course, but the, the workforce is getting older. Uh, at the same time, fewer babies are getting born worldwide. And there's an tr upcoming trend of people working part-time and also the Gen Zs and the millennials. Um, so that's also contributing to this issue. So what Indeed and Glassdoor, uh, they recently published a study in which they made predictions about the entire labor market trends for 2023, and the talent shortage was one of them. Uh, and they basically gave three things that you could do to overcome the talent shortage in the next coming years. Uh, the first one being immigration, get more people from abroad to work for your company, also has slightly to do with political uh, boundaries, of course, that's definitely not our field of expertise for today, <laughs> and investing in more uh, productivity enhancing tools, uh, also not really our field of expertise. However, the middle one definitely is. Uh, so one of the things they gave as uh, something that you can do is start looking at talent differently and also start tapping into groups of people uh, that might oftentimes be overlooked on the labor market. And that is what we are going to talk about today. So, um, I we we talked, of course, before the webinar started, Marcia, and we were discussing, like, it, it's, it's quite a big change that people need to make. Like, we are so used to um, looking at someone's education, previous work experience, and draw a conclusion and basically predict whether someone is going to perform well, yes or no. What are, in your opinion, the, the, the risks of 
um, still sticking to the CV as a method of screening? Uh, to be honest, I never thought that was a good idea because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone lies. They just do. Or, well, at best, they embellish, right? And they even advise you to do that. When you get advice on how to write up your resume, your CV, they tell you, oh, make sure that you adapt it to the job that you're applying for, which makes sense, but also doesn't make sense because you just you want to get an objective picture of what somebody has done. And apparently that doesn't exist. So I think the risk that you run if you focus solely on CV is that you miss out on a lot of talent that might not have the experience that you feel is appropriate. And you can see it happening everywhere. People will say, oh, I'm X Google, I'm X Amazon, uh, because that says something. What, what that says is everyone has biases. And in this case, it's authority bias kicks in. People are like, ooh, they worked at Google. They must be good. And there are like, I don't know how many thousands of people have worked at Google. And maybe they were very average. So you would hire, basically what you're saying is you would rather hire an average person from Google than someone who hasn't worked there or doesn't have that CV who might have a lot more potential. So I think the risk is, that you miss out on people with a lot of potential or transferable skills that don't necessarily have the experience that you think is most relevant. Yeah. Hey, and, and so um, basically I think that the, the state, the current state of the labor market and the future state of the labor, mar labor market is going to force us to shift away from CV based hiring and shift more to potential based hiring. We will touch upon that in a minute, how to do that. But Um, you give a lot of trainings, of course, with companies, like trainings focused on unconscious biases, but also how to implement such changes in the organization. Yeah. How do you tackle the fact that I think CV-based hiring is such a deep-rooted habit for people uh, and, and yeah, old habits die hard? How do you try to tackle that with, with hiring managers or C-level people that are very traditional and really want to stick to a format like that? Yeah. So in my consultancy work, I find it really important to, um, to go to where people are instead of forcing them to come to where I am because they don't have the experiences and the expertise and the things that I have and I don't have their experience and expertise. So I try to understand where they are coming from And then just to take small steps in the right direction. You don't have to go full on immediately. You don't have to go to the extreme, but you can take small steps. So what I usually try to get them to do is do a little experiment. Choose one job, maybe not the most important job. Do a little experiment. See what happens if you change your hiring process just a little bit. It doesn't immediately have to mean they go for CVs first. Maybe I'll, I'll say, okay, let's start with doing a structured interview instead of an open-ended interview. Um, so once they take these small steps and they can see, they can experience that the world won't end and they will still get good people. Better yet, they might get even better people. That will then slowly give them the realization that, oh, wait, there might be something here. And that's where you want to be. It's about behavioral change and you cannot force people to change. So I just try to take those small steps and then really emphasize the successes that it brings them. And then you can see their minds kind of opening and Have to be honest, I've never worked with a company that went to the complete extreme where they completely let go of CVs. I don't know if well, some of them might. I think there might be startups and scale-ups now that are doing it. The more traditional companies, I haven't seen it happen yet. But I think we'll get there. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, what we also see with our customers is that more and more companies are shifting away from using a resume for the first screening. So. Yeah. For example, first doing assessments, then screening, yeah. uh, then an interview, sorry, uh, uh, but still use it, for example, as an input for the interview. So I, 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 I do get what you're saying. Like, I think that uh, lowering the impact of the CV is happening, but completely letting go of it, uh, it, it, there's still a lot of companies, I think, that are just simply not ready for that. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, they've been doing it for decades, right? And and this has only really been a thing, like letting go of CVs has been a thing for maybe five to 10 years, I, I think. So all of these people grew up in a time where CV was basically the only thing you had to go on. So I get mm -hmm. it. I understand it. And we, I think we have to respect that as well. But I mean, I'm on your side with this. <laughs> so I think it's definitely a good development that people are trying to let go of it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's some. Um, I think I have it in one of those slides. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that we always try to, uh, we always use this slide with every single customer to mm -hmm. also basically prove to people like, hey, if you 
are purely focusing on previous accomplishments. Then the the so basically what this is, this is a research that combines hundred years of research into what predicts work performance most. Uh, and um, well, as you can see, education and work experience is quite low, uh, whereas uh, cognitive ability, so problem solving ability, cognitive flexibility, those kinds of things, and behaviors are much more predictive. So that's usually also something that we give hiring managers uh, as some sort of proof of concept there. Yeah. How would you, um, no, let's rephrase my question. Um, going from experience-based hiring to potential-based hiring is quite a big shift for companies to make. Like even if you want to break through your habits and you actually want to implement that, this is a huge thing to implement in your organization. Where would you advise people to start or how to start? I mean, I would, we're talking about assessments and I think that would be the most logical place to start. It starts with, and then also using the right assessments. So, you know, there are personality assessments I don't feel are the right place to start, which is still where I see a lot of companies going, oh, we're going to do a personality assessment to figure out who people are. Uh, I think looking at the, the cognitive abilities and the behaviors that you see on the screen right here, like that slide ex really explains the best starting point. If you have a proper assessment that measures people's cognitive abilities and their behaviors, you get a profile of a person. So it's not about checking the box and saying, oh, he, ha he or she has this behavior. This is what we need. So this is what we're going to hire. Or you want to get a full picture of someone as complete as possible. And measuring cognitive abilities and behaviors is going to help you to figure out how are they actually going to do when they get to the team. So using that as a starting point and then figuring out what is it that we need on the team. I think those two things need to go together. Just doing an assessment and then sort of guessing what is going to work is also not the right way to go about it. So figuring out what behaviors, what skill sets are we missing? And then measuring those skill sets, then you're going towards measuring potential. And yeah. I think measuring potential is so much more important than finding out what people's experiences are. Yeah. Hey, and, and um, you just said like, you also need to figure out what you need in the team. I think yeah. extremely important one. I see a lot of companies using assessments also as a way to just reject or advance people based on scoring benchmarks or whatever. And Sometimes I'm thinking like, I don't know if you're actually, if you're including this assessment because you know that you need it or because you just want an assessment to uh, filter out people. So I do, I do really agree with what you're saying that it's extremely important to know what you should be looking for by capturing the existing team. But how would you, how would you go about that? Because that's, that's also quite a big project. It is. That's also one of the things that I help organizations with. If they want to change their hiring process, one of the first conversations that I have with them is, okay, so tell me what you're looking for. And then I challenge them on it because quite often when people have a job opening, they'll grab the job description that they created five years ago and they'll put that on LinkedIn and that will be it because that has been the process for many, many years. So what I help them do is to evaluate what is the actual job? Like what are what what does the work consist of? And based on that, you can determine, okay, do I need somebody who is very flexible or do I need somebody who is a little bit more structured in the way they do things? Do I need somebody who takes big risks or do I need someone who's a little bit more conservative? So by having those in-depth conversations with your team in which everybody really consciously reflects on what does the team look like right now and what is not here yet, that's going to help you to figure out, one, what to put in the job description, which is essential, and two, what skills you then want to measure when you do that assessment. Yeah, yeah check. Uh, uh, by the way, I see some questions coming in from Charlie and Veronica. We are going to get there in a second. Um, the one topic I wanted to touch upon before we move on to uh, the questions is the shift that we are about to make in the labor market is probably going to have a huge impact on uh, DNI, uh, fair hiring opportunities for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your what is your view on that? I think you kind of have to, <laughs> because if there's such a big shortage on the labor market, then you're going to need to broaden your perspectives to find hidden pools of talent that didn't come to the surface before, but that you need to tap into now in order to just fill the jobs that you have. So. Aside from the human rights perspective, which I think is really important, I, I'm a believer in you know, equal opportunities and all of that. But even if you 
don't really care about that. It's a necessity. So yes, it will change because when there's not enough people out there, you're going to need to broaden your horizons to find the people. You're going to have to look at hiring for attitude, training for skills. It's going to be about transferable skills. So it will help companies at least become more diverse. I'm not 100% sure about the inclusive part because that's a yeah. little bit of a bigger challenge, but this will definitely help to bring more diversity into the organization. And that, in my book at least, is a very good thing. Yeah. Hey, and, and being an advocate of the devil here, uh, because uh, I, I agree, if you need to look beyond, for example, the resume and focus more on potential, you do provide more equal opportunities for people. Mm-hmm. And, and, and hopefully it results in hiring more uh, diverse people. Yeah. But how is that going to impact the people who are being hired who would usually be filtered out based on their resume, for example? If now let's rephrase my question. I think that equal opportunities now in this trend comes from an external motivation. We yeah. need to look broader than than uh, the usual requirements, otherwise we won't fill a job position. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that intrinsically you believe in the yeah. fact that uh, you need to long, look beyond the resume and provide everyone with an equal opportunity. So what happens if those people get in and the organization is definitely not ready for that? Is that a risk that you see with what's happening now? Yes, in fact, it's what I've seen happening a lot. I've also seen a ch- I've also seen a change in how organizations are approaching this topic. So, in for the past couple of years, they have been focused very much on diversity. My expertise is inclusion and bias mitigation and things like that within organizational cultures. And I've seen a shift where organizations are now asking me, "Okay, so how exactly do we go about creating an inclusive culture?" So, yes, the risk is that you bring these people into the organization. But if you don't have that inclusive culture in which they are actually able to thrive, in which there's actually room for them to grow and use their uniqueness, their difference to add value in the current labor market, they're going to be like, okay, bye, because there's like a thousand other jobs for them to choose from. So it really goes hand in hand. You cannot only focus on diversity. You also need to take a long, hard look at your organizational culture and think to yourself, are we ready for this? And if not, what can we do to get ready for it? Because you will be in trouble if you don't. Like your turnover numbers will rise because there's no reason for them to stay. And honestly, what I've seen happening is, yes, we brought in people and now we're teaching them how things are done around here. That's yeah. not what you want. Oh, that doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. 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 And I really believe in uh, also proving the... Uh, the added value. So something that we, for example, do with a lot of our customers is the the customers who want to let go of the... I learned about a new term yesterday, the paper ceiling. It's basically the, the, the glass ceiling, but then for people without education. Okay. So we, we have a lot of uh, customers who are now trying to shift away from education as a requirement. Uh, so what they do is they basically let people also complete an assessment and if their score is basically good enough, then they, they go to the next round of the interview. Uh, and um, they are showing their hiring manager afterwards, like, hey, this is someone that you found amazing and you ended up hiring this person. And guess what? They actually don't have an educational background. So um, I am a big fan of some sort of confronting them with data. <laughs> uh, how would you, is, is that something that you also try to do with the companies that you're working for? Because that's, also quite tricky to do it is and it's a risk because the and the risk in this case would be that you happen to bring in someone who doesn't like when it doesn't work out then they'll immediately say oh see it doesn't work yeah so yeah (laughs) so that's the risk that you take which means you still have to be very intentional and and conscious about the decisions that you do make but yes i love that data driven approach as well and again that's just one of those experiments that you can try out um, you don't have to do it with uh, a board member or, uh, I don't know, the, an MD function, managing director function. No, you can start a little bit lower in the organization because that makes people feel better if it's not if there are not too many responsibilities uh, attached to the job. And just experiment, just try it. And then see if you're able to train them on the technical skills that they may need and bring them into based on their cognition and their and their behavioral skills. So. Yeah, I'm a big fan of data-driven approaches. Again, the risk is if you fail in one of those experiments, their bias will kick in and they will say, see, it doesn't work, so now we're never going to do it again. Yeah. So um, 
in that case, you said at the start, like start small, maybe yeah. try it with one job, but maybe yeah. to limit that risk, you maybe should say start with at least like three or four so that you have a bit more experiences to share. Yeah, so I would start with one job description. Um, so it, it starts with that whole evaluation process, right? So you don't go immediately go to hiring a lot of different people. I would start with one job description for that evaluation process and then in an ideal world, I would say, okay, we're going to finish this experiment when we've hired five people or something like that. Yeah. So the experiment just runs over a longer period of time. But if you try to do all five of them at the same time, then it immediately feels like a big thing. But if you say over the next 12 months, we're going to do five little experiments where we hire yeah. people with a, in, a, in a different way. And then at the end of those 12 months, we're going to evaluate. I think that might be the best way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Check. Hey, uh, Veronica is asking, um, how do you measure potential or behavior? Um, well, I mean, assessments and especially gamified assessments, uh, and I'm well aware of the fact that because of my background, I do have a bias here, but I chose it for a reason. Gamified assessments bring out natural behavior in people. So instead of asking someone, are you good at problem solving or giving them some sort of theoretical question about it, you actually give them a problem to solve. That's how you measure what somebody will do. And because it's in a gamified setting, it's engaging, it's immersive, and they will start to show their actual natural behavior. So that's a good way to measure behavior. Measuring potential, again, that depends on what do you want to know. So once you know what constitutes potential in this case, what set of behavioral and cognitive skills you need in order to be successful, then you need to find the people with those skills and that's going to form your potential. And with potential, um, your base, could you give a couple of examples? Yeah, so it, it's in this case, potential is the potential to be successful on the work floor, right? So you need uh -huh. to have, um, so for a, uh, so I'm, I'm going to generalize here just to make, to make the example work. So for a software engineer, for example, if you have, if you want to find potential, a potentially good software engineer, you need somebody who has a systematic way of approaching things, a systematic way of thinking. The opposite of systematic is empathetic. So systemizing and empathizing are, is, are both on a spectrum. So if you want to measure software development potential, you measure where they are on the spectrum of systematic thinking. And the more they are on the systematic side of things, the more potential they have to be a good software developer. Obviously, this is more nuanced than I'm putting it right now, but that's how you measure potential. You have a spectrum, you figure out where do you need to be on that spectrum to have that potential, and then you measure it. Yeah, check. Yeah, because what was another interesting research, I think, yeah, I was very well prepared for today with my slides, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this one. Um, is that uh, the World Economic Forum, every five years, they publish a research with their sort of predictions on the labor markets. Um, I know that there are some mixed opinions about the World Economic Forum, but I do still think that the research is an interesting one uh, in which they make the prediction that in the next five years, we're going to lose millions and millions of jobs. And we are also getting a lot of new jobs. Um, so that, again, uh, together with the labor market, the shortage also forces us to look different at talent. So, the, yeah, you mentioned software engineer. I think that's and uh, uh, AI engineers may be a very new kind of job over the last, uh, what will it be, 10 years, maybe 15 years. I don't know for how long it is there. So apart from potential being needed to overcome the labor shortage, the labor market shortage, you also have to with all those new jobs arising, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and that makes it even more important to look at potential. Like, again, what do you need in order to be successful in a specific role or in a specific world in this case? Because... If you go to school to learn a certain, I don't know, you study finance or whatever it is that you, if you study IT, even if you study IT now, by the time you graduate, there will be so much new technology out there already that what you've studied might not even be relevant anymore. And that means that you need to look at someone's potential to learn those new skills. So do they have the right way of thinking? Do they show the right behaviors to have potential to be good at this specific job? Because the job, literally, a lot of those jobs aren't even here yet. So how do you look at experience? You can't because the jobs don't exist. So yeah, it sort of makes the case for looking at potential over experience. Yeah, check. Hey, I got a, the Charlie asked the question. Um, uh, basically, how, how do structured interviews relate to 
work performance. Could you explain a bit more? Yeah, I think when you do a structure, I think, I mean, obviously I, I don't have this study present in my mind right now, but the, the relationship between structured interviews and performance in general is if you have a structured interview, then you only ask the questions that you need to know in order to find out if someone is suitable for the job that they're supposed to do. So a structured interview is asking everyone the same set of questions based on that thorough evaluation of what is it that we need. Instead of having a very casual interview in which you ask things like, what are your hobbies, which is the most bias written question that you can ask people, because if they have a hobby that you don't like, again, subconsciously, this is not something that happens consciously in our brains, subconsciously, that will activate all sorts of biases. So by doing a structured interview, you get more insights into how is someone actually going to behave once they're on the work floor, because you've asked them the right questions. That's why there's a relationship between structured interviews and performance. Yeah. I don't know if she, you see that too, but I see a lot of emojis now going through. Yeah, the so that so I think that's probably that's because your answer. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is a new feature. <laughs> um, cool. With five minutes left, uh, Veronica asked a question, and I think it, it needs some clarification on what you just yeah. said with like NS1, what if it goes yeah. wrong? Because she was asking, so you basically say that data driven approaches can lead to. Biases. Biases. Could you briefly explain again what you meant with like be aware of like small experiments and 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 yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, no, data driven approaches don't necessarily lead to biases. The thing is, biases are already there, <laughs> and you need to deal with them as effectively as possible. And if you have a very small data set, so if your data driven approach is we're going to try this on one job and we're going to see if it works, in essence, that means you're only going to hire one person. What if that happens to just not work out? Not because of their background, but just because of it wasn't a good fit or something happened in their lives or whatever the reason may be. Then negativity bias will kick in. And negativity bias basically means that people just tend to look at the bad side of things, like things that are bad or stronger than things that are good uh, under the category of safety biases, as in us as human beings, we just don't like to take risks. So that will kick in, that bias will kick in. And then the person responsible will say, see, we tried this, it doesn't work, so we're not doing it again. So if you use a data-driven approach, it's important to make sure that the data that you use is sufficient to make the case, make the objective case for what you're trying to do. N is one, it's not enough. So you're gonna need, I gave the example of doing it at least five times over a period of 12 months, because that will give you enough data to say, yes, this works, or no, this doesn't work. Super clear, thanks. Um, I see two more coming in. There's one from Walter saying, wouldn't semi-structured interviews give more space to think of candidates' potential? Yes or no. So semi-structured means that there's some wiggle room there for you to phrase questions a certain way or to go in a different direction with your questions. That's absolutely the case because there's more room to talk. However, that also opens the door to bias more. So the more structured it is, the less room there is for bias to creep into the whole process. Um, but however, there's also less room for like the personal touch to interview. So I always say, I always advise companies to do what feels right for them. From a theoretical perspective, the most effective one to mitigate bias is a structured interview. The most effective one from a personal connection standpoint is to have a completely unstructured interview. And usually companies are somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe to add to that, um, I'm also doing a lot of interviews myself here. Uh, I think an interview will never be 100% structured because there's always an intro and an outro and people tell you something and there, yeah, I mean, there's always slightly different information, I think, for candidates, but I completely agree that uh, it, it's, I mean, we're not living in the perfect world, so an interview will also never be perfect, but try to stick as much as you can at least to yeah. asking the same questions. Yeah. Um, Sonia, I see two questions from you. We have one minute left, so I'm going to answer one of those for you. And uh, our colleague uh, Kat posted a link to our community in the chat. That's uh, our Breaking Bias community that you can sign up for, where we can answer the questions that uh, we didn't answer yet today. So definitely recommend everyone, by the way, to sign up for the community if you would like to learn more about unbiased hiring. Um, but your question was, how can we visualize to our hiring managers why we shouldn't hire based on experience or academics? 
well, I, I don't know, Marcia, what you think, but my my one would always be what's here on the screen now is just the evidence that it doesn't work. There is hardly, there's a very low correlation between experience or education and how you're going to perform. So, yeah, you can't really disagree with what research has shown, I'd say, but I don't know, Marcia, if you would like to add something. I've had some experience where they definitely did. Yeah, <laughs> Same. It does happen. However, you know, this is about having a good conversation and about continuing the conversation. So not just trying it once. It's like repeating, repeating, repeating and doing it in a way that is not you, you try to be create psychological safety for them to have their opinions as well. And then just start asking questions to get them to realize that it doesn't work. So if you ask them, why do you think, you know, experience matters and then dig a little bit deeper? OK, could there also be a different side to things? I always advise people to use Socratic questioning. Socrates, the philosopher, he was very good at asking questions. You can Google those questions. They're why, what, how type of questions. That helps you to help them reflect on their own decision-making process here. So it's, I mean, it takes some time, but using the data that's available, like the stuff that's on the slide right now, combined with having those non-attacking open conversations about the topic in general without making them feel like they're doing something wrong that will hopefully lead to the self-reflection that you need in order to get them to agree to this i've seen success happening doing it that way yeah yeah and um something i must say by the way that all the, our hiring managers here are biased by default of course for not <laughs> looking at a resume but uh, what I also try to do as well with our customers for example if people really want to stick to education there's always a, a reason why they want to do that so for example a lot of people still think that education tells a lot about someone's intelligence yeah so if you could say hey but there's actually research that might show that that's not the case but what if you could measure for example intelligence I always find it a bit of a bad word intelligence but let's call it uh, cognitive abilities then or general mental ability mm -hmm. what if you could measure that directly so that you're sure about it instead of making an assumption based on education then yeah. i usually see that that could also be at least a good conversation yeah. starter um having that said uh we are a bit over time sorry for that um i hope that everyone enjoyed the insights of today again if you do have any follow-up questions uh feel free to join our community and ask any questions that you still might have and Marcia, thanks again so much for being here um you're always a big uh, <laughs> a big ambassador i think there's i'm a big, big fan people. that's what i am charlotte a big fan <laughs> <laughs> We're also a big fan of you. So thanks so much for joining again. Uh, and also for everyone who joined the webinar today. Uh, and I wish you all a great rest of your day. And yeah. you too, Marcia. Thank you. Ciao. Bye, guys.